Good luck, Michael. Talk to you. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But The Truth. It's January 21st, 2015, and once again we have Yerk from... Uh, or Yerk, excuse me, I say your name wrong every time. My apologies, my friend. Uh, Yerk from... Uh, uh, Jiggler 66 YouTube channel, and also um, Tom Press from. Oh my gosh, Tom! My brain is not working. Inqu- Inquisition position update. I wish I should know, but my brain. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been listening to it for over almost a year now. York, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you very much, Michael. And then Tom. Hi, Michael. Good afternoon to you, and good evening to uh, York over there, in Europe. Yeah. Nice to be with you both and anxious to get started. All right. I'll hand it over to you, gentlemen, and uh, I'll try to contribute as much as I can, but as I already told you, I'm not feeling too hot today, so i got to try to hang well. So. That's all right, Michael. We will do the best to replace you as far as that is possible anyway. So I'm sure you'll do a fine job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have a good show. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. So we are... Tonight, continuing about our reading from the website www.remnantofgod.org from the 26 listed characteristics of the Antichrist there. And um, today, we will start at characteristic number 20, because last uh, time that we did the show, I think some three days ago, um, we were extensively going on uh, number 20 and did a three-hour show on that. So when you missed it, uh, dear listener, look it up on the website and uh, have a listen at that because I think it's very interesting. Uh, All of the points that we are doing here are very interesting, of course, because when you uh, when you want to walk in the in the way of Jesus, you also have to know who your adversary is, who your enemy is. And uh, this document is one of many other documents, of course, next to the Bible where all these Antichrist characteristics are uh, exactly taken from. Um, and that, without any doubt, does identify the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. So when you follow Christ, Antichrist means that he is the adversary of it, and uh, then you also must know who he is. And if you cannot correctly identify the enemy, you're always turning in circles and have no idea where all the attacks come from, all the attacks in your daily life, and surely not all the attacks of your spiritual life. That starts, of course, with corrupted Bibles that we had already a broadcast on, and that starts, of course, also with the wrong teaching that you can follow in any church, because it's not only the Roman Catholic Church. Um, The Roman Catholic Church is the mother of all harlots, and these harlots have become apostate daughters of the harlot. And by that, I mean the worldwide congregation of the Lutheran Church, and I mean the Baptist Church, and I mean the Pentecostals, and I mean all the other denominations that especially you in the United States of America have there, because we don't have that, much, that many German denominations or Protestant denominations over here in Europe, but in America you have a lot of them. And even if you think, well, the Seventh-day Adventists, um, they surely preach the true word of God, well, you probably will make a broadcast about that, and then you will see that even the SDH Church or Seventh-day Adventist Church have been founded by Freemasons, and by that under the auspice of the Jesuits. And there's more than proof enough of that, and surely when you go also again to the site uh, remnantofgod.org, there's a whole chapter on um, the SDA apostasy. So when you think that uh, even in the SDA, they will will now for teach um, the real word of Jesus Christ, you will learn that it is not that way. I'm very sorry to tell you that, but you have been deceived all the way from, like Tom put it in one way, and Walt also said, from cradle to grave, we are deceived. If we don't learn to look out for ourselves, and if we don't search the truth. And this is what this broadcast is all about. This broadcast wants to help you to find the truth. That's why it's called Nothing But The Truth. But of course, we are also only men, and we can err, and when we are, we stand for it. So when you are listening to this now live in the, in the broadcast, you can, of course, write something in the chat room and uh, put questions in there or comments in there. And uh, as we have time, uh, when we will have 
go into that, of course, like we always do in these broadcasts. And uh, when we make an error, well, we make an error, but we are very profound of trying to tell the truth and nothing but the truth and just all of the truth. That's all this about. Um, Tom, do you have uh, something like an opening statement too, or do you want me just to go on reading or have something? No, go go ahead and read the article having to do with the the Antichrist must join the kings of the earth. I would only begin uh, by describing the kings of the earth the way Daniel did in his prophecy. Daniel, in his prophecy, likened the four beasts of his prophecy. Uh, he likened them as kings and kingdoms. And, of course, we know the papacy claims to be the king of kings. So all the kings of the earth and all the kingdoms of the earth must do what the Pope says. And uh, uh, so uh, this goes back to the subject we we talked about in another broadcast, that the Bible interprets itself. So when we're talking about the, uh, the beast, we're talking about a king, that is the papacy, and the kings over which he rules. And the Bible tells us that that he rules over the kings of the earth. So, uh, look, uh, for the for the beast to do its work in persecuting the saints, which the, exist all over the world, then the beast or, or the papacy must have the cooperation of the kings of the earth so that every nation and every kingdom persecutes the saints. The Pope can't get on a moped, ride all over the world with his entourage of inquisitors and burn people at the stake. That would be too obvious. That's how they operated during the old world order. And, uh, and, and if we read any history books about the old world order, about the dark ages when the Pope ruled over the kings of the earth, just like the Bible describes, he always used those kings and those governments over which they ruled to round up the Bible believers and persecute them, confiscate their property, burn them at the stake, burn their Bibles, uh, take their children and put them into... Uh, Roman Catholic schools, and uh, that's the way the old world order worked. That's the way the new world order works. Uh, The beast, as described by Daniel, couldn't exist without the help of the kings of the earth. And so what we're seeing in the new world order is simply the reconstruction of what 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 existed and what characterized the Dark Ages when the popes were in their supreme, uh, in the height of their power and authority. As someone might snicker and scoff at the comment I made earlier to Michael, uh, that the Pope is the President of the United States. That's biblical. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. The Pope is the King of Kings. And so every king and every government must pay his first allegiance and his first obedience uh, to the King of Kings. And that's not Christ, it's Antichrist, it's the papacy. All right, Yerk, with that, I'm sure this article will be very revealing. I think so, too. Thank you very much for that explanation. <clears throat> As you already said, the headline of um, characteristic number 20 is Antichrist must join with the kings of the earth. But you have to understand that this must join is more a superior role. The Antichrist must rule with the kings of the earth, and he must rule over the kings of the earth. That's exactly a little bit more precise. And to make that clear, I'm going to cite Revelation 17, chapter 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. End of quote. Were you aware that as of the year 2000, there are over 170 ambassadors to the Vatican? And were you also aware that every one of those ambassadors, as well as each delegate from each of those nations, must have at one time or another bowed before the Pope in an act of worship by kissing his reign? Keep in mind that the Vatican is not only a religious organization, it is also a bona fide nation as of 1929, 
when Mussolini signed the Lateran Treaty with Cardinal Gaspari. That means the Vatican is the only religious organization that has a seat in all United Nations meetings, or as prophecy describes it, the Vatican religious organization has joined with the kings of the earth. Rome does this so the Vatican can use its national status to perform religious acts it deems necessary in a global agenda. And all nations that have any interest in global movements have already stated they agree with the Vatican. They have openly joined with her on many issues of global importance. In fact, not a single nation makes a major move or adopts a national policy without first making sure it doesn't go against any plans of Rome. If they do, Rome will most assuredly use the power of the land-horned beast, the United States of America, to make sure they stay in line. Plus, as of the inception, the Roman International Criminal Court System, the IRCC, coming to be in 1999, all nations know <clears throat> that it would not be a wise decision to go against the Vatican. What with the USA, or as prophecy defines it, the lamb-horned beast bowing to the Vatican's suggestions regarding warfare. This, by the way, is regardless of what the media pumps before the masses. They know that to go against Rome would be futile. Many historians tie all the modern-day wars and most wars to the past to Roman Catholic influence. The prophecy is sure when it is said that who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? As quoted from Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. Of course, this final hour prophecy being spoken of is yet to arrive when all the kings will join with Rome and its in its globally realized attack on the true Christian that follows the Lamb whithersoever he goes. But <clears throat> when that day comes, it will be their final act of rebellion against the Creator God. That act will end with their total destruction as Jesus Christ himself, with his Father, will split the eastern sky to put an end to their blasphemous reign. However, as of April of 1968, we see that day approaching quickly that day approaching very quickly. The adaptive model of the global world system is through the Club of Rome at its beginnings in April of 1968 when leaders from 10 different countries gathered in Rome. The organization claims to have the solutions for world peace and prosperity. The Club of Rome has been charged with the task of overseeing the regionalization and unification of the entire world. The club's findings, so it means the Club of Rome, and recommendations are published from time to time in special, highly confidential reports, which are sent to the power elite to be implemented. May I, may I make a comment, Jörg, before we continue? Yes, of, sure, of course. I, I, I think it's important to point out to the listeners that the Club of Rome is appropriately named. Uh, the oh, Club yeah. of Rome is a Vatican think tank, and their objective is to unify the entire world under the authority of one single person, and that being the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible. That, that is their purpose. And I want to remind the listeners something that is oftentimes forgotten. Remember, the Bible describes a time when all the people of the earth were united under the authority of one man, and that was Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. And God said, look, see, the people are one, and look what they are attempting to do. Let us go down and confound their languages. And, 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 they, and God went down and confounded their languages and broke the people up by confounding their language. They couldn't communicate with one another. So those of like language segregated themselves so that they could communicate and there, thereby God created the nations. And thereby he scattered them into their own lands so that they could never, <clears throat> mankind could never all be united once again to rebel against the Lord and to serve a man. And what the Club of Rome is, is a Vatican think tank to come up with a solution 
to break down the borders of the nations and to make all the people one again under a single global sovereign entity, the papacy. And so we're, we're, we're seeing Satan's answer to what God did at the Tower of Babel. God separated the people and established the nations by confounding their language. The, the, the papacy is uniting all the nations of the world and placing them back under his authority. That's why I call the papacy the modern-day Nimrod. And it, it's simply uh, Satan's answer to what God attempted to do and did at the Tower of Babel. And, and, and the... And the uh, the proof of the papacy's objective in all of this is clearly depicted, as we talked about even before the show, where, where they depict the world in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a, a graphic form of a Tower of Babel. And even the caption, out of many people, one tongue. You know, many, many different languages, one tongue. Uh, and words to that effect. It's a direct assault against what God did at the Tower of Babel. And it marks the papacy as the Antichrist. It marks the Club of Rome as a functionary of the papacy, of Antichrist. And uh, I just didn't want that to be lost to the listeners. I mean, sometimes when we start talking about these organizations, we fail to make the link back to the Vatican. And we fail to remind sometimes the listeners what the Vatican's objective is globally. And uh, many people just don't accept the things that we say about the papacy unless we show them. And uh, look, uh, the, the, the title of this discussion is, is uh, uh, The Papacy Will Unite with the Kings of the Earth. And uh, I, I suggest that people go to Google and type in the word Pope and then any na- the name of any president or king or potentate in the world. And, you, and then go to Google uh, images and see for yourself that the kings of the earth all in their turn go to the Vatican just like the president of the United States wearing black and if their wife goes with them, they wear black and they wear black veils and they worship the beast. They worship the papacy. They obey him. They bow down and kiss his ring. And uh, as unlikely as this sounds to many people today, it's as obvious as the nose on your face. This is easily researchable information. And what role, what role the Club of Rome plays, what role the United Nations plays, what role the European Parliament plays, all the, the, the Bilderbergs and, and, uh, and all these... Vatican think tanks are working on one objective, to unite all the kings of the earth again in servitude to the papacy. And, uh, you know, Michael even begins every program with a reading on Yahoo Yahoo News, uh, headline after headline after headline focusing on how the pope is instructing the kings of the earth and how much influence the papacy has on every aspect of our lives. And they're all implemented, all of the, the Vatican's teachings are implemented through our civil laws. And this is where, again, I'd like to make mention and recommend people go to YouTube and watch the video by Richard Bennett entitled, Vatican Control Through Civil Law. Vatican Control Through Civil Law. And you'll see this for yourself. And it, it'll, it'll start to make all the sense in the world. It'll help you, help you understand what direction the world is going and what purpose it serves and be able to then see who the enemy is and how he functions and how we need to be separated from that and joined to Christ and him only. It's, it's the battle of the titans, Satan and Christ. And we have to make a choice. The kings of the earth are serving Satan. They are confederated against Christ. They are confederated with the papacy. And we're all their subjects in this, in this, in this realm, in this life. 
But we have to resist this evil. <clears throat> and uh, I've said before, I'll say it again, it's crunch time for Christians. It's now apparent what Satan is doing through the, the, the papacy and the kings of the earth over which he rules. And uh, uh, this article is making it plain. Thanks for just giving me a moment to, to impress upon people the, the importance of what you're reading to them. And hopefully they'll take it upon themselves to do their own research. Go ahead, Jörg. Well, that's why you're here, Tom, and thank you very much for explaining that a little bit deeper, and you gave me a chance to mention also something else. Um, in my early stage of awakening, I uploaded a video on YouTube on my channel, Juggler66, that is called Dr. John Coleman, The Club of Rome, Chatham House, and the Committee of 300. Um, that is even the video that I'm uploading right now on vid.me, because somebody told me that there's a video platform where you can even be anonymous, so I'm going to upload there a lot of videos now too, <laughs> see how that goes. And uh, if you have any doubts on the 10 regions, but well, first of all, when you have about, uh, I don't know, 180, 190 nations in this world right now, and then you combine all these nations into 10 different regions, uh, these 10 regions can be easier handled than 190 plus nations by themselves, individually. And if you want to see proof of that, just type into your Google engine 10 world regions or 10 world regions map. And you will, uh, you will get about 528 million results, as I got when I just typed that in. So you can do an extensive search on that for yourself. And you don't have to take our word for it. You can always check on yourself. Like I always said in these broadcasts, do your own research. Believe no man. Okay, uh, continuing this last paragraph. I'm going to start from the top on the last paragraph. The club's findings and recommendations are published from time to time in special, highly confidential reports which are sent to the power elite to be implemented. On September 17, 1973, the club released one such report and entitled Regionalized and Adaptive Model of the Global World System. The document reveals that the club has divided the world into 10 political economical regions, which it refers to as kingdoms. They actually use the same terminology expressed in prophecy. The Lord stated that they would have 10 kings in the end that rule the world, and the club of Rome declares it will be 10 kingdoms in the coming days. For more information on these plans, see my June 2006 Truth Divided newsletter that you can get on uh, www.remnantofgod.org. And this completes our reading of the 20th characteristic of Antichrist. And uh, I will ask John to maybe make a closing statement on that, uh, if he hasn't done that already in this <laughs> explanation he did before. But I think he still has something to say to you. So. Yes, I, I do, as a matter of fact. Uh, one thing that Nicholas uh, failed to mention, or at least I missed it if he did, was the fact that the Vatican, being a state, it's both a church and a state, uh, has made national and international binding agreements with the nations of the world. It's called con they are called concordats, and uh, they're binding. They bind every nation to these contracts, these concordats with the Vatican. And one of the essential uh, components of every concordat that the Vatican signs with the nations is to uh, set the groundwork, at least, for the final establishment of Roman Catholicism to be the nation's religion, a state-sponsored religion, meaning that the Roman Catholic uh, religion will be the dominant religion in every nation. And not only that, but uh, other religions will not be tolerated or at least relegated to uh, second and third class status in the nation. Furthermore, that the Roman Catholic Church would be state-sponsored. In other words, the tax money that is collected by the government will be used to help support the Roman Catholic Church. 
that the state will purchase the land for the cathedrals and that a certain amount of the tax money goes to building cathedrals and churches and that Roman Catholics have special authority within the government, that Roman Catholics have a special role in uh, education in the schools. And uh, you'll have to ask yourself, what other religion on the planet signs concordats with the nations and the kingdoms, the kings and the kingdoms of the world, guaranteeing that that be the, the official religion of the nation? There's not another one on the planet. It's the Roman Catholic Church. And this is one of the most positively identifying characteristics of Antichrist that he would unite with the kings of the earth. And not only that, but bind them through legal contracts called concordats. There's no other example of this in history. This is unique to the Roman Catholic Church state. And it cannot be confused uh, with anything but what the prophet John, the prophet Daniel, and the, and the prophet Paul called the beast the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn. It is the papacy. And uh, what is most uh, astonishing to me is the fact that during the Protestant Reformation, these facts, these biblical, historical, and prophetic facts were written about and spoken about and preached about from all the pulpits of the churches. This was common understanding. No one doubted the assertion that the Pope was the the papacy was the Antichrist. No one questioned or doubted these characteristics that we've been reading in this program pertain particularly and solely to the papacy. This knowledge that the papacy was the Antichrist literally drove the Protestant Reformation. It's what caused the Protestant Reformation. And uh, it's astonishing the the few people in the world that that comprehend this today. When it was was, uh, universally known during the 16th century. It's, It's, well, I'll just put it this way. This kind of ignorance, this blackness of ignorance could not have happened but for the help of Satan and his vicar in Rome. It's no wonder the Vatican demands to have control of the, of the, uh, of the education systems of the world so she can erase from the history books any knowledge of what the old world order was Because if we knew what the old world order was, we would each and every one of us recognize what the new world order is. And uh, when one becomes more and more aware of what the old world order was and how it operated and what changes are taking place in domestic policy, foreign policy, international policies, uh, these leagues of nations, the United Nations, uh, the Vatican's input on nearly every aspect of human life, its focus upon the governments of the world, we would each and every one of us instantly recognize what what is really taking place. None of us would be, see, be deceived by the 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 bankers or the rich ruling elite or secret societies, we would know who runs them all. And uh, I hope before the Lord takes my last breath that I am able to, to inspire people to investigate these things for themselves, see it for themselves. And uh, Nicholas from remnantofgod.org does a marvelous job but I, I dare say that there aren't but a handful of people 
uh, within the sound of our voices that have ever even heard of a concordat. What is a concordat? It's a binding agreement signed between the king of kings in Rome, the Vatican, the papacy, and the governments of the world. And you have to ask yourself, why have I never heard about a concordat before? Go ahead, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I also have to uh, state something else, but in the same matter, of course. Um, Nicholas was talking in the beginning of my reading about the Lateran Treaty or the Concordat that was signed between Mussolini and Gaspari in 1929. And I have something that is also very important and that is for me as a German very important and uh, most people in Germany are not aware of. Within less than half a year of Hitler taking power in Germany in 1933, the German Reich also signed a concordat with the Vatican. Interesting to see is what people were involved in there. And I'm going to read a little bit of the Wikipedia page that speaks about the Reich's concordat from 1933, 20th of July, by the way. So that's only about four months after Hitler came to power. And important people, of course, this is not stated in Wikipedia because they never tell you the whole truth. But in Wikipedia, it's also mentioned who were the responsible people for that. And uh, the foremost German who was there to sign that was the vice chancellor, Franz von Papen. What they don't tell you is Franz von Papen was a high knight of Malta and a Jesuit. And on the Vatican side, the Concordat was signed by... Um, I want to get his name right, um, Eugenio Pacelli. And Eugenio Pacelli, Pacelli, who was the Secretary of State for the Vatican at that time, later became Pope Pius XI. Uh, Pope Pius XII. So I'm going to just read the first three paragraphs of this uh, article on um, the Reich's Concordat on Wikipedia. And I have to tell you, because I researched this, the Reichskonkordat signed 20th of July 1933 between the German Nazi Reich and the Vatican State is still in contact and still working today. It is still a legal binding contract. Although they tell all the German people all the Nazi laws have been abolished with the going down of the Nazi Reich in 1945. That is another blatant lie. Anyway, I'm just going to read this first three little uh, paragraphs here. The Reichskonkordat is a treaty between the Holy See and Germany negotiated during its transition in the, into Nazi Germany. It was signed on the 20th of July, 1933, by the Secretary of State, Eugenio Pacelli, who later became Pope Pius XII, on behalf of Pope Pius XI, and Vice Chancellor Franz von Papen and President Paul von Hindenburg. You probably in America know them from the blimp that caused fire there in Harrisburg. On behalf of the German government, respectively. The treaty guarantees the right of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany, but Nazi breaches the agreement began almost as soon as it had been signed, leading to protests from the Church, including the 1937 Mit Brennender Sorge encyclical of Pope Pius XI. The Brennan Sorge, that means with burning concern, uh, that encyclical from Pope Pius XI. The Reich's Concordat is the most controversial of several concordats between Germany and other nations that the Vatican negotiated during the pontificate of Pius XI. It's frequently discussed in works that deal with the rise of Hitler in the early, uh, early 1930s and the Holocaust. The Concordat has been described by some as giving moral legitimacy to the Nazi regime soon after Hitler had acquired quasi-dictatorial powers through the Enabling Act of 1933, through Reichskanzler Hitler himself, is, uh, is not a signatory to the treaty, and the treaty does not make mention of Hitler or the Nazi party. The Concordat is addressed to President Paul von Hindenburg. The treaty places constraints on the political activity of German clergy of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. This contributed to a decrease in the previously vocal criticism of Nazism by, by the hierarchy of the Catholic Church in Germany after September 1933, 
when the treaty was ratified. From a Roman Catholic Church perspective, it has been argued that the Concordat prevented even greater evils being unleashed against the Church. Though some German bishops were unenthusiastic, and the Allies at the end of World War II felt it inappropriate, Pope Pius XII successfully argued to keep the Concordat in force. It is still in force to this day, end quote, as I earlier mentioned. And, you know, this Concordat they signed, they also needed it because on the one hand, they told the Roman Catholic Church, we are on your side, but they gave them the possibility to get rid of a lot of liberal Catholics in Germany because there was persecution of Catholic priests in Germany, or priests in that time, but those were only the liberal. All the ones that were going to work for the one world order agenda that Hitler had in mind were of course not persecuted. So once again, when you read this Wikipedia stuff, you have to be very careful because Wikipedia is an open source. Uh, it's edited by a lot of people and there are a lot of untruthful things in there, but you can always get an idea about of things that you can research after this. And uh, I'm just going to post the link to uh, the article that I just read in the chat room, and then you can read it for yourself and do your own investigation after it. But this Concordat is, uh, I mean, you have to consider Hitler wasn't even for six months in power when he signed that Concordat, or let sign that Concordat by his vice chancellor, who was a Knight of Malta and who was a Jesuit. Keep that in mind. Yes, and I'd like to comment also that uh, Germany is still bound by that concordat, as you well stated, and the Vatican still has control over Germany through these concordats. Well, I want to point out something also that was mentioned in that article, that the Vatican negotiated treaties between Germany and other nations. That's incomprehensible. What this literally means is that the Vatican establishes the foreign relations and the foreign policy of Germany. Now, think of the ramifications of that happening between the Vatican and the United States of America. Well, they're doing it's, that already with the Council well, on Foreign Relations. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed, it is happening through the Council on Foreign Relations which is an organization run by high powerful Knights of Malta and Freemasons and other knighthoods of the Vatican, they're the ones who pick the candidates for the presidency of the United States. The most powerful political people in this country belong to the Council on Foreign Relations. They're the ones who pick the candidates for president, both, both, both liberal and conservative. So the Vatican literally controls both political parties. And it doesn't really matter which, which candidate you vote for, uh, for president, whether it be of the left or the right, they're Vatican picks. And so no matter who you vote for, you have a Vatican insider elected to the presidency. And also I want to comment about, uh, the, you know, the, the Wikipedia article uh, uh, talked about liberals a liberal Roman Catholics. Now, I some about this. yes, indeed, uh, the liberal Roman Catholics from from Rome's point of view is those who wish to uh, change the mass or or offer the the cup, uh, the Eucharistic cup, the blood of Christ to the laity, like the, uh, uh, when when the Latin Rite insists that only the priests can drink. And there's a lot of other things, but what it really boils down to is these liberal priests in, in, in Germany that were exterminated right along with the Jews were sympathetic to Protestants. They wanted to live in peace with Protestants. They wanted to, uh, uh, you know, live in harmony when the papacy has always denounced uh, Protestants as heretics. I mean, after all, they protested against the Antichrist, the papacy. So the papacy's not going to tolerate any Roman Catholic Church or any Roman Catholic priest uh, sharing a hand of friendship with Protestants. And so these liberal Roman Catholics, if, if this, this uh, 
this purge of heretics in Germany and uh, uh, the Second World War was going to have any effect, they had to first get rid of the the, uh, the liberal Roman Catholic priests. Otherwise, they might have they might have operated secretly to help the Protestants and the Jews escape this persecution. And uh, so they call this the blood purge. It's known as the blood purge. You know, it, the article in Wikipedia says that before the ink was dry on the Concordat between Hitler's people and the Vatican's people, Hitler started violating the, the terms of that, of that Concordat. But the Concordat is a public document. The Vatican secretly wanted the liberal Roman Catholics destroyed so that they wouldn't work against the war effort. And so there's a public policy, which is evident in the Concordats, but there's also a secret policy. Now, I, I ask the listeners, you know, you, you can look high and low. You'll find no mention of a Concordat between the United States and the Vatican. But I assert there is a Concordat written or not, between the Vatican and the United States of America. Otherwise, the United States wouldn't be fighting these papal proxy wars in the Middle East. The Vatican, uh, the United States would never have entered the Second World War if the American people, the Protestants of this country, knew that it was just, that the, the, the Second World War was just a persecution against non-Roman Catholics they never would have supported the war. And uh, it's, also been, it's also been released through uh, the Freedom of Information Act. It's now become common knowledge that Roosevelt knew about Pearl Harbor and let it happen in order to get us involved in a papal proxy war in Europe uh, against Germany. And I, I suggest that maybe the United States wasn't intended to win that war, but it did nonetheless. But in the process, look what happened to Germany. Look what happened to the German people. Look what happened to six million Jews. And nobody ever talks about the Protestants that were killed. Nobody ever talk, Nobody's ever counted them. And I, I maintain that the Protestants far outseeded, exceeded the number of Jews that were destroyed. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I don't. I do not minimize. I do not minimize the fact that World War II was a persecution against Jews. That was one of the major intents of the Second World War, a papal proxy war to to get rid of the heretics. The Jews were considered, especially those who who refused to accept a modern nation state of Israel, who refused to go down to Israel, refused to immigrate to Israel, and said literally that if God is going to restore us to our homeland, he will restore us the way he did when he brought us out of Egypt and, and miraculously led us to the promised land. If we're going back to a homeland... If we're ever going to have a homeland of our own, God is going to give it to us, not man, no government of man, no papacy, nothing else. Those Jews had to be silenced, and that's how they silenced them, the Second World War. And they also silenced a lot of Protestants, too, many more Protestants than they silenced Jews. And uh, uh, people in America are completely oblivious to this. And it's high time. It's more than high time. If this is a desperate situation we're in. We're seeing our government destroying all of our rights. We're seeing uh, U.S. military forces operating within the boundaries of this country, which is a violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. We see, we see local police forces, state police forces, gearing up with 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 military weaponry they're they're fixing to reduce this country to chaos and they've got their targets ready and i don't if if anybody's paying attention to what's going on in this broadcast they ought to darn well know who our government is going to ta- target anyone who objects to this new world order and especially those who know who's at the top of this new world order. 
the Vatican, the papacy. It's, it's, uh, it's, I've researched it so long, I've become so familiar with the goings on. Uh, it's a marvel to me that other people are so slow to pick this up. You're, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this program. Yeah, um, I don't want to go too deep into the Holocaust issue because I have um, done some research into that. And um, the only thing that I want to mention here for the people who are listening right now is look a little bit into the Holocaust that was performed on the German people. Search the uh, Rheinwiesen Lager or the Rhine Meadow Camps from Eisenhower, where there were at least one million German soldiers starved to death after. April uh, or May something, May 9th when the war ended, 1945 and get the book from James Buck, Other Losses where you can read all of this that is a holocaust that is never spoken of, or even think about the Dresden bombing where the, where the Americans and um, the United Kingdom uh, bombers killed at least 500,000 civilians in the city of Dresden in 1944, I think that was. And um, this is kind of a Holocaust that is never spoken about. But you always have to see the two sides of it. And for the rest, I will not mention the Holocaust right here because I can go to prison tonight if I do. So, <laughs> And I love my free life here. But um, I think we have continued now enough on uh, characteristic number 20 of, uh, or was it 21? Um, number 20, on um, characteristic number 20 on the Antichrist, and I will go on reading the document on uh, characteristic number 21, then, that is, and uh, that is entitled, The Antichrist Will Mock Christ So As to Confuse the Unlearned. And that, of course, is an easy thing to do when the Antichrist controls all the Bibles that are out there, and again, I uh, advise you to go to another broadcast that we did on the counterfeit Bibles, uh, where Tom did a lot of explanation about how and why the AV 1611 King James Bible is the only reliable Bible that English-spoken people have today to study the Bible. Because when you read the NIV and the NSV and all these other Bibles, Bible versions, you will see how corrupted they are. And uh, Michael also did um, a very good thing about that when he mentioned the website biblehub.org, uh, I think it is. Uh, just type in Google Bible Hub and you will see that, and there you can compare what is written in the King James and what is written in the other Bibles. So, of course, the Antichrist will mock Christ so as to confuse the unlearned, and he will surely use all the corrupted Bibles that he has put out there in the time in the meantime, so I'm going to start reading here now the article. Many people the world over will be drafted into total acceptance of the Antichrist theology by sheer ignorance. This is becoming an easy task for all in fact. They have already gotten their churchgoers to refuse the Bible. All throughout its history it has shunned and even declared the Bible a dangerous book. Most Catholics that I have met before and after leaving this church have stated they never read a Bible. In 1229 AD, the Catholic Church even put the Bible on the index of forbidden books, as we learned earlier. So that was mentioned in another characteristic of the Antichrist. And uh, there are a lot of quotes from uh, even the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church uh, where you can look that up. And uh, I guess we will make another broadcast on that. Rome still has a problem with the word to this day. Walk into any Catholic church and you will find what they call a mislet to be used for the Mass. It's a small booklet filled with prayers, bits and pieces, out of context Bible passages and songs to be used in the Catholic Mass. I recall as a use how some people would get strange looks if they would enter the church with a Bible. By the way, it's not just Roman Catholicism that has um, this problem now. Um, on my um, bogus Bibles page, you, know, you can look that up in the index on the web page, uh, in the warning section of the website, I share proof that the Vatican has been instrumental in rewriting the modern-day Bible to fit their dogma. 
Start at the top of the page and work your way down. You will see a pattern as to why certain verses have been rewritten or completely removed from most Bibles today. I share the facts on two of the most popular Bibles on that page, the NIV and the NASB. If you never heard of these before, be prepared for a shock. Well, like, like always, I don't read this document beforehand, so you see what I just mentioned is coming up uh, as topic here. If you don't have a trusted King James Bible, you may miss some of the ways the Antichrist mocks the Lord to try to pull people into their camp. So, how does Antichrist mock the Lord? There are actually hundreds of ways, but to give you a quick idea, I have a few I can share with you here. Prophecy stated Antichrist will rise out of the water. Jesus arose out of water at his baptism. Jesus reigned the, the earth for three and a half years in his ministry. The Vatican killed over 500 million people and reigned on earth for 1260 years. 1260 is actually three and a half prophetic years, as we learned earlier in another broadcast also. Jesus was mortally wounded at his crucifixion. The Vatican was mortally wounded in 1798. Jesus resurrected. The Vatican resurrected in 1929. Both Christ and the beast have many horns. The Lamb of God has seven horns in Revelation 5, uh, uh, Revelation 5, verse 6. The beast has ten in Revelation 13, verse 1. Both Jesus and the beast seek and receive worship. Both Jesus and the beast have a global and universal agenda. Jesus for the good of all eternity, of all for eternity. The beast for the death of all for eternity. Jesus was born of a virgin. Antichrist of old stated Tammuz was born of a virgin. Both Jesus and the Vatican claim a day <clears throat> or rest and worship. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. The Vatican admits to inventing Sunday as their day, as we will get into much more uh, detail later. I could actually go on and on with the literally hundreds of proofs that shows the Vatican will take the Bible uh, will take what the Bible says and then twist it to a fit pagan or Babylonian doctrine. But I feel this next set of facts should suffice. I share this because it is quite shocking and eye-opening at the same time. It has to do with the Roman Catholic mixed God of Christmas. The facts I am about to share is about, uh, is about a very small portion of facts from my Christmas page on the website and the warning sections of the menu. There's so much evidence on that page that shows every aspect of Christianity is mixed with paganism and then used to mock the Lord Jesus Christ. But this set of facts I'm about to share is what I consider to be the best example. So, um, Tom, if you're there, yeah. um, would you go along with me doing the same as I did with Michael last time? Uh, I read one column and you read the other one, so that means I read what uh, what Santa Claus says and you say what Jesus Christ says. Oh, uh, you're uh, on that page. No, I'm not. Uh, show me how to get to it, and I certainly uh, will. Page 94 on the um, on the PDF document. Um, you got that I one? I don't think I have the PDF document. Okay, when you, Santa Claus strangely compared to. No, but when you, when you have the unlearned one, just in the characteristic number 21, well, you are reading from, and, yeah? Sorry to interrupt here, but if you look yeah. at those columns, too, it's just, it's not really, where it says Jesus Christ, it's just, it's just giving the verses. Yeah. It's so just I, I, unless you want to go through the verses throughout the Bible, which is not, not a bad thing to do, but uh, actual... <laughs> Actual, there's not actual quote from Jesus. It's just no, um, that, that would be too great extent. I, I see what you mean. But I just thought it would be interesting if Tom just, uh, Tom just let the Bible right. verse according to the uh, to the sentence that I read. So, right, best for you yeah. just to read the sentence, you know, and it's uh, yourself. Oh, okay, okay, then then I will just go on and reading it. Um, okay. So we say what uh, Santa Claus by way, uh, by way of speaking is, and then strangely compared to Jesus Christ. First part, Santa Claus has white hair like wool. Jesus Christ has that in Revelation 1, 14 and Daniel 7, verse 9. Santa Claus has beard curly and white. 
and the revelation, uh, the, uh, the comparison to Jesus Christ is then in Isaiah 50, verse 6, and in Revelation 1, verse 14. Santa Claus comes from the North Pole, and you can check that with Ezekiel 1, verse 4, Exodus 26, 35, and Psalms 48, uh, verse 2. Santa Claus is omniscient, knows about all. And you can compare that in Revelation 19, verse 6. Santa Claus is ageless and eternal. See Revelation 1, verse 8, 21, verse 6, and Hebrews 13, verse 8. Santa Claus makes a list of judgments that you can find in Revelation 20, verse 12, 14, verse 7, 21, verse 27, and 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 10. Santa Claus checks list twice, and you can go there for comparison to Daniel 8, verse 14, Matthew 10, verse 26, and 1 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Santa Claus gifts given on basis of lists, and you can compare that with Matthew 25, verse 21, Revelation 21, verse 27, and 22, verse 14. Christmas rewards only once yearly. You can uh, compare that with Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32. Santa Claus confesses wrongs. Uh, he confesses wrongs to Santa. Uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, promise to be better next year. Compare with John 14, verses 15 and 21, uh, John 15, verse 10, and 1 John 2, verse 3. Santa Claus asks children to obey parents. Ephesians 6, verse 1, Proverbs 6, 21, and Colossians 3, verse 20. Hour of his coming is a mystery. Compare that to Luke 12, verse 40, Mark 13, verse 33, and Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Rudolph's shining nose to guide. You can read that in Matthew 2, verse 2, verse 7, and 9 through 10, and also in Numbers 24, verse 17. Santa Claus calls all children to his knee. Matthew 19, verse 14, and Luke 18, verse 16. Be good for godness sake. Matthew 19, verse 17, Colossians 1, verse 29, and Philippians 2, chapter 13. Santa Claus has a twinkle in his eye. Compare with Revelation 1, verse 14, and Revelation 2, verse 18. Swift visit to whole world in one day. 2 Peter 3, verse 8, Revelation 18, verse 8, and Isaiah uh, chapter 47, verse 9. Santa Claus is omnipresent found in every mall. Psalms 139, verse 7 to 10, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. And Santa Claus says, ho, ho, compared with Zechariah chapter 2, verse 6. One more thing that bothers me about this is how Antichrist has convinced most parents it's okay to teach your children to lie. Like many of us, when I was a child, I was told that Santa Claus was quote-unquote all-powerful because he makes millions of toys and delivers them in one night. He defies the laws of nature by flying and jumping down narrow chimneys. With Santa, all things are possible. He is by definition omnipotent, which by definition means, quote, having unlimited power or authority, all powerful, the omnipotent God, end quote. That is from Webster's New World Dictionary. I was told that good old Saint Nick knows all things, at least he knows when every boy and girl is bad or good or how they behave throughout the year. He is by definition omniscience, which by definition means, quote, having infinite knowledge, knowing all things, the omniscient, omniscient God, end quote. 
even uh, also taken from Webster's New World Dictionary. Think about that for a moment. Parents all over the world have been telling bold-faced lies to their children since birth about a fat man in a red suit that comes down the chimney to place gifts underneath the tree. Now guess what happens when the child comes of age. The child realizes that mommy and daddy have been lying to him the whole time. He now figures lying is okay because mommy and daddy do it. And not only that, but this child realizes that it worked. He actually realizes that his parents lied to him and he believes them. So now he has concrete evidence that lying is a resourceful tool that he can use to his advantage. And his own parents taught him it's okay to do so. For me, the most insidious aspect of all the characteristics of quote-unquote Santa Claus being literal parallels right out of the scripture describing God is that once the child realizes that Santa Claus really doesn't exist, what is the natural implication? God doesn't that exist. God doesn't exist. And that's, that's what is to be accomplished by this satanic so-called holy day called Christmas. It's a mockery of the kingdom of heaven, his Christ, and his believers. And it's diabolical from stem to stern. And we ought to abandon it, just as the, the Jews ought to have abandoned their idolatries and worship God in spirit and in truth. Look, the Jews were bitterly punished for mixing these pagan traditions with the pristine worship of God. They were sorely punished. And if, if and we've done exactly the same thing, exactly the same way. And if, if God doesn't punish his people, then he needs to apologize to the Jews. I look for God's judgment. Now, people, Christians, quote-unquote Christians, like to criticize me, just lambaste me for pointing out the paganism of Christmas, as if I'm touching something that's really holy. That's just how apostate Christianity is today. And, uh, you know, what is sad is that each and every one of us can read our Bibles and and of all the examples that the Jews and Israel uh, bowed down and worshipped images and idols and baked cakes to the, king, the Queen of Heaven and and sacrificed their own children and and we see how in the world could these people who God led out of Egyptian uh, captivity fall to such depravity? We can easily see how the Jews betrayed God, but we can't see our own, and we won't admit our own. And I'll tell you what, I've received death threats from people for telling the truth about Christmas, but I won't be silenced. And uh, I thank Nicholas from RemnantGod.org for taking such great pains to show the apostasy. I thank you, Brother uh, uh, Yerk, for reading these characteristics of the so-called Santa Claus and how they directly parallel what is said in the Bible about our God. Literally, Christmas does nothing but make a mockery of the God of heaven, leads us all into parallel mockery of the God that we profess to serve, and all of it for our own destruction. And, uh, you know, everywhere in the press you'll see condemnations against the war on Christmas. Well, I'll tell you what, it's an all-out war, and I know who's going to win in the end. There were days in my life, most of my life, as a matter of fact, I'm nearly 60 years of age, and I participated in this abomination. I'll never live it down. 
I repent, and I think God's people ought to all repent of Christmas and all these other so-called Christian holidays that are not holy at all. They're diabolical from their root. They're designed to destroy us and to so anger our God that he, that he punishes us. Listen, it's one of the great strategies of Satan. He doesn't have to lift a finger against us to kill us. All he has to do is cause us to anger our own God and let God destroy us. He saw it happen to the Jews, and he's going to do it to us too. And I don't want to provoke my God to wrath. I've abandoned Christmas. I've abandoned Easter. I've abandoned the so-called Christian Sabbath, Sunday, and I'm going to worship God in spirit and in truth, and I don't care how much criticism I get for it. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. And um, that was a very interesting point that you made about there, that when the children learn about the reception of Santa Claus, that they actually also think that is, of course, a reception of God there. And that's one more step in taking away the Bible and the Word of God of the daily lives of the young ones. And um, I don't know where the quote exactly was made from Jesus, but he said, if you betray these young ones, you'll be better hung up with a millstone and uh, thrown into a river. Right? That's one of the uh, things that he said in his gospel. Okay, I continue the text right now. The Library of Universal Knowledge says, quote, Nicholas Saint of Santa Claus, a highly popular saint of the Roman Catholic Church and reverenced with still greater devotion by the Russian Church, which regards him as a special patron, was one of the early bishops of Mysia in Lycia. The precise date of his episcopate is a subject of much controversy. Of his personal history, hardly anything is certainly known, and the great popularity of the devotion to him wrought through his intercession. He is regarded in Catholic countries as a special patron of the young, and particularly of scholars. On the, vid on the vigil of his feast, which is held on December 6th, or St. Nick's Day, a person in the appearance and costume of a bishop assembles the children of a family or a school and distributes among them to the good guilt nuts, sweetmeats, and other little presents as the reward of good conduct. To the naughty ones, the redoubtable punishment clan both. The supposed relics of St. Nicholas were conveyed from East to Bari in the Kingdom of Naples towards the close of the 11th century. End quote. Thus, the fable is a part of the old relic worshipping traditions of a corrupt church. The nearness of his feast in December to the Christmas festival led to associating the saint and the present giving idea with the feast of December 25th. We must admit, in the light of the Bible, that it is very foolish and wrong to teach little children the tales of Santa Claus. Little children, keep yourself from idols. And this ends the quote from the Library of the Universal Knowledge. The Lord demands more of us than of them, because we have come into existence in the age of wonderful research and discovery, quote, when the knowledge should increase, unquote, as Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 said was inevitable. The Bible has been in our mother's tongue several centuries now. In the light of this situation, we would certainly deserve severe criticism for our ignorance if we should continue to honor old traditions or relic worship. Still, most people do this day in the name of Christianity. In essence, they mock the Lord just as Antichrist has taught them to do. Is this any different than the quote-unquote certain damsel of Acts chapter 16? No. It's not. Certainly, most are completely unaware they, were, they are doing wrong. And praise the Lord, we have a merciful God, for it is written that he actually winks at our time of ignorance. Compare with Acts chapter 17, verse 30. 
Many upright Christians in the past have taken part in the old festival to some extent, and such will not criticize because they did it in ignorance. But in this enlightened age, it is indeed high time to inquire, quote, what concorded, what concord had Christ with Belial, and, or what, had, uh, what part had he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols, unquote, from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. We as Christians need to take a stand and stop this open mockery of our Lord Jesus Christ. If the Vatican wants to continue on, let them. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Still many Christians, not only Catholics, but also Protestants, continue year by year at the Christmas festival to honor the old idol relics under a Christian garb. This is indeed very unfortunate, and it is going so far that entrance fees are demanded in many Protestant churches for their Christmas place. Oh, what a dishonor to our dear Savior, who has pointed out a distinct line between the holy and the profane. Praise God. So I think, Tom, that Nicholas took the words right out of your mouth when he said that many upright Christians in the past have even taken part in this old festival to some extent. And, of course, I did that also. The first time that I did not celebrate Christmas anymore was, I think, some two years ago. And before that, okay, I lived alone. I didn't really celebrate it anymore. It didn't mean anything to me. But um, up until the time I was married, that's about 11 years ago right now, um, Christmas was a very uh, <laughs> a holy day, I cannot say, but uh, it was a celebrated holiday by me and by my family. So I'm very glad that I could convince my mother that uh, Christmas is just um, a mockery of Jesus and uh, we do not uh, participate in that anymore and I will never again participate in that anymore because my eternal life with Jesus Christ is much more worth than the life that I have here in this Roman Catholic uh, matrix system they set up in the kingdom of Antichrist. I'm just looking forward to get to the real kingdom. Very well said. Okay, we have been busy for an hour and a half. Um, do you think that we should still take on the next point or shall we leave that for the next reading and maybe come to a closure right now? Well, I think an hour and a half is long enough for most people, and especially uh, when they're hearing information that is so contrary to the common belief. Uh, I think it becomes overwhelming to people. But I think it ought to be clear by those who are of honest uh, souls, those who are of honest hearts and intellectually honest with themselves, the Scripture condemns most of what is called Christianity today. And uh, we need to repent. We need to do as Daniel did in the first two-thirds of the ninth chapter. We need to get on our faces and acknowledge our sins and confess them before the Lord. And we need to do it with fervor, with, contri with contrition, with contrite hearts. We're no longer ignorant to the designs of Satan and his Antichrist in Rome, and we need to make a break. We need to make a break from this Antichrist system and repair the breach between us and our Lord and put away those things that stand between us. We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness anymore. Before we were ignorant, but we're not ignorant anymore, and we can't just pay lip service to uh, our relationship with Christ. We must make our actions consistent with our words, and no better time than the present. And uh, with that, I'll let you close. Uh, here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we have some guests in the chat room. Uh, if anybody has a question on the things that we we're speaking about today. Now would be the moment to post that question and then we can still go on 
and doing that. Otherwise, I will round this broadcast up right now with almost an hour and a half going on. And um, thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time. And, um, you know, we didn't do this for our fame. We did do this broadcast, like all the broadcasts we do here, to bring fame and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in his name, I thank you very much. And um, and, uh, in Jesus' name, I thank the Father and the Holy Spirit that they held their hand upon us doing this broadcast. And um, I leave my closing remarks to Tom and Michael. Thank you very much, and uh, goodbye.